A group of London renters who were screwed over during the pandemic have just won £19,000 from their billionaire landlord. Four housemates had organised during the pandemic to receive a 20% rent reduction due to income lost over the lockdown. They started a renters group with their neighbours to lobby their landlord, who was George Christodoulou, and he is a Monaco-based property magnate and 82nd richest man in Britain. So this was a big, bad landlord. Now, this billionaire landlord refused. He told them to instead use their unspent lunch money to make up their arrears. But the last laugh was with the tenants. On Wednesday night, a housing tribunal approved Jordan Osserman, Mark Sutton, Foivis Dusos, and Daniel Mapp's request for a rent repayment order, or RRO, a little known legal mechanism that since 2004 has meant renters can get back up to a year's rent if their landlord has failed to license a house in multiple occupation, or a HMO. Though not unprecedented in itself, Wednesday's judgment is likely to trigger a chain reaction that will benefit not just this household, but the whole block. Summerford Grove Renters, an association of tenants living in properties owned by Christodoulou in Stoke Newington, North London, estimates that 50 further SGR households could be eligible for RROs, totaling half a million pounds. Osserman says he expects theirs will be the first of many wins to come. In this situation, the landlord was able to say, no, I'm not going to give you any any rent rebate over the pandemic. Unfortunately, landlords still have that in their power. But he had not registered the property correctly. He hadn't licensed it as a house, a house of multiple occupancy. And now he could have to pay uh, around half a million pounds to his various tenants, a big win for the renters, one of whom I spoke to earlier today, Jordan Osserman. I asked him about his expectations for this case and whether they were surprised by their victory. At the start of the process, um, we were just asking directly our landlord for a small reduction in rent um, to help out neighbours who were struggling with finances during the pandemic, who were losing income. Uh, we had no idea that it would go as far as it did. Um, we certainly weren't expecting to go to a tribunal fighting our landlord um, legally. Uh, but we were fairly confident that we had a good shot at this case. You know, we did our research and um, we worked with a lawyer who was uh, volunteering his time to help us out. So we, we knew we had a shot, but it was a really tough hearing. Um, the judge seemed quite unsympathetic to us. Um, and so I think it's really a testament to the work that we did, um, the Summerford Grove Ventures campaign as a whole, uh, in order to win the case um, that, that we did actually win. So yeah, I would say we were, um, you know, we had our fingers crossed, but we were pleasantly surprised with the outcome. This case was absolutely part and parcel of the work that Summerford Grove Ventures and London Renters Union have been doing. It, this wouldn't be possible without us having constituted the Summerford Grove Renters. I mean, basically, we started as a bunch of neighbors who were trying to help each other out during the pandemic. We became a formal organization and then joined the London Renters Union. And it was through that process and learning from what the London Renters Union has done, working with them to build skills in terms of how to like door knock, how to work with our neighbors, how to kind of organize collective action. It, it was all of that, that that made this case possible. So it, it absolutely wouldn't have happened otherwise. It can be pretty dispiriting being a renter and um, the government is against you. The laws are against you. Landlords are often against you. Um, but there are ways to organize and to fight back. Uh, there are organizations doing incredible work across the UK, in addition to the London, London Renters Union, groups like ACORN. Um, and also um, do your research, because oftentimes, as, as was the case for us, um, it required us spending a lot of time learning what rights we did have um, and pressuring our local council and pressuring other kind of, you know, power holders um, to act that that led to this success. So uh, I would tell fellow renters, I, I'm hoping that fellow renters will see our case as inspiration for their own struggles. That was Jordan Osserman, whose who's victory in this case is all the more impressive because, as he says, the law really is stacked in favour of landlords and against renters. It was also a particularly unusual situation in this case because there was multiple households with the same landlord. In this country, we have a very distributed system where lots of people just have their one landlord. They don't know who they are. Quite difficult to organise against them. In this situation, I think there's about 70 households with the same landlord, which is why this can be used as a, a precedent to get to get other people this same, same compensation. So very, very impressive campaign. Not a sign 
that the system isn't broken. Um, as I've already said, the renters weren't able to, to force um, the landlord to give them a deduction due to the pandemic. I want to show you another article from Navarra Media this week. This was by Aaron Bastani. It's an article with a great picture of Aaron and his dog, Gino. And Aaron wrote about how, how moving from being a private renter to a homeowner made him realize how much the former was damaging his mental health. Aaron, it is a really great piece. Can you tell us about it? Well, yeah, thanks. I mean, it's um, it's very kind. It's had lots of positive feedback. It's important to say as well, Michael, it's not about, oh, if you get on the housing ladder, everything's fine. Uh, th that's why we have housing security in the title. Um, I lived in London for 15 years. I lived in, I think, about at least 15 properties over 15 years. I never had a home. The watchword of politicians since I've been an adult is community. But our housing model means that it's absolutely impossible for people in my situation, and I'm sure that applies to many of our viewers, to actually be involved in a meaningful community because you know that in a year or two, best case scenario, you'll be priced out and you have to leave. Uh, and so in terms of what it changed for me, I, I talk about how I, I hit a, a low point about seven years ago, just a confluence of things, lack of money, uh, PhD. I mean, look, you, you don't start a doctorate to earn money, but it was it was tough. It was things were getting really tough. Uh, broken relationship with an ex-girlfriend didn't work out, kind of went uh, EastEnders. You know, I ended up with my stuff outside the front door. And ag again, that's actually, it's really important to say that was a function of us, neither of us having that much cash and a very stressful situation and in London, you know, little things like having a spare bedroom where somebody can sort of, you know, let off steam or something. None of that existed. Broader support networks you would normally take for granted often aren't there because people are having to move into zone four, zone five. They're neglecting their friendships. The work can be stressful and so on. So that led to a broken relationship, money problems. And then my mum died, right? which was just really tough. So I really hit a kind of a rock bottom there. After about another year, uh, I, I started taking antidepressants, uh, sertraline. It was more for anxiety than depression. It was the, the smallest dose, 50 milligrams, but it was transformative. It was utterly transformative. And then very quickly after taking that, super quickly, I sort of had the clarity about what I needed to change to, to help myself. One was to leave London. That doesn't mean everybody has to leave London. I think if you're very affluent, if you're rich, you can definitely enjoy London. If you're willing to go through the grind for certain reasons, brilliant. If you've got family and friends there, I get it. But for us, the calculation didn't quite make sense because we wanted to have kids and our families are down here on the South Coast. So we moved. And then not long after, about a year later, we bought somewhere. Uh, we bought somewhere because my partner earns a lot more than I do. It's important to say this at Navarra Media, everybody earns the same wage. Everybody earns the same wage. You have a pay ratio of one to one. Um, she had two thirds of the deposit. Um, I had one third from book royalties, not, not huge money, but it meant we could buy a terrace house on the South Coast here in South Sea, which we, we never could have done in London. And the consequences of that were incredible, Michael, absolutely incredible. And I understood all of a sudden why all these quite affluent people really can't understand, can't comprehend, can't get in the shoes of generation rent. Now, it's not to say, you know, there are older people out there who still rent, of course, but we know that home ownership is, is just falling off a cliff now in terms of in terms of age uh, for younger people that are just far less likely to be getting on the housing ladder than older generations and of course there's less social housing too so the option is to go into the rental market and it's just such a weight came off my shoulder when i left that michael you know it, it took a couple of weeks and i realized wow i can put something on the wall i can actually change the, the surroundings i live in i can actually make meaningful relationships with my neighbors and local businesses knowing that i won't have to move in a year's time and, and those aren't huge things to ask michael those aren't huge things to ask and so it might seem that oh you're saying well you had a home of your own it's kind of like a thatcher i think not at all i think secure tenancy would do would, would do exactly the same thing more social housing expanding minimum ten tenancies. I think we need more rent tenancies five, 10 years in this country. Rent caps, getting rid of HMOs. HMOs are effectively turning these buildings, which should be flats and houses and co-ops, turning them into effectively machines that just extort value from their tenants. Uh, and I, I, I think if you really are serious about addressing the mental health crisis in this country, you have to talk about the housing crisis. You have to. You have to, because it's the number one need. I got somebody in my reply saying, oh, first world problems. Absolutely not. Shelter is not a first world problem, my friend. 
A sense of meaningful community and relationships with other people is not a first world problem. You know, it is it is expensive to be poor. And one example of that is when you have to move every 12 months because you have to pay the removal costs, you have to get time off work, you sometimes need to buy new furniture because something breaks. Again, people watching this know that story, but it's something that's really lost on much of our political and media class, Michael. Really, you know, uh, Andrew Marr, he lives, I think, 40 minutes from, from, from where he has to work. He basically walks there uh, at the BBC. You know, many of these people have never even rented, or if they did, it was briefly as students and they really don't get the state of the housing market in this country and how it is destroying people. It is destroying people. And so for me, getting out of that situation, you know, I'm not going to adopt the I'm all right, Jack attitude. It's about, wow, this is so screwed up. And it's actually relatively easy to remediate through a bunch of measures I've already, already said. Uh, and the crying shame is that, you know, where are the politicians? Where are the leading politicians? Other than the previous Labour leadership saying, this is what we're going to do. I've not heard anything positive from the Labour Party or from Conservative politicians about this. It's always build more houses. Well, you can build more houses and, and that's great. But if the price of housing is going up and it is going up, I think in the last 12 months, the average house went up to like 12, 13, 14 percent, then that doesn't help anybody. You know, so yes, of course, we need more more houses being built, but we need a fundamental change in the housing that's already there. Like I say, through things like rent caps and and minimum tenancies. It's one of the things I find so frustrating about the way we talk about mental health within neoliberal capitalism. Because whatever situation we live in, whatever system we live in, I'm sure in communist systems you also have people who are struggling with mental health. But there is so much. I mean, it should be low hanging fruit, and this is all perfectly manageable. You know, you, you don't have to have some, uh, rev or you, you shouldn't have to have some sort of revolutionary communist system. That's just social democracy. Give people who 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 want affordable rent, affordable rent. And yeah, that, then we can just stop all of these campaigns. We've got Prince William saying, oh, let's talk about mental health. How about we just give people somewhere to live, which has some security where they can build some community and where they're not terrified they're going to be, be, be kicked out all the time. It, it shouldn't be that complicated. Uh -huh.